Hey, it's tag video time again. I'm saying time instead of Tuesday because I don't know when I'll put this up. Uh, probably sooner than that because this has been around for a while. It's the Isaac Newton tag. And it was very kind of two people to, to, to tag me to do this. The first was the creator of the tag who's called, his channel is called Reading Ideas. It is the first tag he's ever created and he put a lot of thought into it and I, I think it's a, a very uh, interesting one to do so I encourage you to do it whether I tag you or not at the end I'm getting ahead of myself it would be nice to support him in this tag uh, because because of those reasons I was also tagged uh, just the other day by Gavin at genre books and I'm really glad he did tag me on it because I did not see the first the first tagging I don't know if other people have this problem when I look at uh, my notifications I don't always see when people have mentioned me on, on their channel. I have to go to the separate tab for that, even though I'm looking at the Everything tab. Anyway, so I didn't see that originally. So fortunately, I uh, finally uh, got word of it, and now I'm doing it. So it is. Uh, there are 12 prompts. I'll put them, you know, as usual, put everything in the comments, all the details, in not in the comments, in the description. But anyway, these are, are tags about uh, name books, or talk about books based on different events in the life of Isaac Newton. Number one, adopted or sent away or abandoned. A book with a character that is adopted, sent away, or abandoned. So right away I've learned more about Isaac Newton than I knew before the tag. I didn't know this was part of his history. Now Gavin, uh, the way he handled these tags, and I think it was very smart strategy, so I'm going to rip it off. He kind of went them at a, a skew, and uh, I had to think about this for a day or two because I don't want to keep mentioning the same books, my you know my fifteen favorite books of all time, in every single tag. And I want to you know pretend at least that I'm more well read than that. But anyway, on this first one, I'm going to do the first book that came to mind, which was something I read this month called "The, the Prince and the Pauper" by Mark Twain. Reminded me very much of a Robert Louis Stevenson type story. Uh, there's a prince, there's a pauper. They switch place. They meet. They switch places to see what the other's life is like. They do this on their own, you know, and they have adventures. The the pauper boy is has an abusive father, abusive alcoholic father. Uh, that the prince has to deal with the the. The pauper has to deal with the princes, the royal family, who, who uh, think he's gone insane because he's claiming to be a pauper. Because you know, almost right away, these people, do, these two kids decide. I think they're around nine, ten years old. They decide this is like their way in over their heads, and they want to get back to their own lives, which proves difficult because nobody believes either one of them. So he isn't really sent away or abandoned or adopted because they the kids do this on their own but um i still think it applies since they're they're taken away from their families and they're not able to get back and and they're and they're left to their own devices anyway so number two is use or measurement of time a book where time is a crucial element I probably should have mentioned I'm going to be pausing a lot more than usual because I want to really get the uh, names and things right in this. And I didn't write them down beforehand, of course. Violated another commandment there. Um, for this one, I am going to say the book The Score, which is a Parker novel written by Richard Stark, uh, which is a pen name for Donald Westlake. I think it's about the fifth novel in the series it has to do with a heist in a town. Um, Parker is a professional thief, and is and he's got got. Uh, I'm trying not to sneeze. I might have to keep stopping for sneezing too because I've got allergies today on top of everything else. And he's got a crew of people he works with off and on, different people, and they get proposed. Uh, the job that's proposed is to loot an entire town after dark. After after it closes, they're gonna you know rob the jewelry store, rob the bank, rob uh, whatever. All the then there's a big twist that happens 
as there always is in these Parker novels, it's never really about just the heist or the planning of the heist. The heist is kind of secondary compared to what happens, how it all goes wrong. Every every Parker novel is about a problem he has uh, when something goes wrong with one of his crimes and how he has to get out of it or, or get back to, to normal. Time plays a big factor in it. It's I'm, there's probably even other Parker novels that time plays a bigger factor in it, but this comes to mind um, just because of the time limit on how how long they have to do this. Well, you know, before before daylight comes. Number three, test of strength, a book where the character has to pass a test of strength. I'm going to go with the first um, Matt Helm novel by Donald Hamilton that is Death of a Citizen, which really, and it was a very long series, I've talked about it before, but as, as people remind me, as I'm reminded on other videos, you know, people don't watch every single one of your videos, so it's okay to repeat stuff, but Matt Helm was a long-running series, probably ran from like the, I don't know, from the 60s to the 90s or something like that. From the first book, I suspect it wasn't intended to be a series, certainly not a long-running series, because it was about an ordinary guy who's got ordinary problems who falls back into a espionage-type plot, more or less accidentally. Anyway, in the novel, he's out of shape. He's forgotten his wartime experience in this very brutal... Uh, sort of um, intelligence terror, you know, counterterrorism unit or something. Uh, you know, I guess maybe like the Inglorious Bastards or something in the in, of the Tarantino movie. Uh, just a very elite force, and you know, and it's this is takes place about sixty five, I think, is when it takes place or sixty. So he's out of shape. He's just a normal suburban guy now, and he gets in, uh, confronted with these um, sort of a, at least in the beginning, we we feel like this, this espionage plot, this assassination of a physicist who just happens to be a co-worker of his wife at at the university where she works. Uh, this Nobel physicist is, Nobel winning physicist is assassinated in Matt Helm's house. He's just a guy named Matt Helm at this point. He's just, he's not the super spy that we might recognize if you know a lot about old movies and old pop culture and that. And so he has to sort of uh, get himself back into shape physically and mentally um, to help solve this, you know, to handle this emergency that happens. So that's a path of, and he does do it, of course, uh, spoiler alert. If he didn't, there wouldn't be much uh, point in having another 25 books to follow it anyway. So he does pass that test of strength. Four, number four, character with a dark side or temper. Uh, here's a book I talk about all the time. I just put a poll up about it last week, Lonesome Dove. The character of Gus is more the uh, like demonstrative, outgoing um character in of, of the two main characters in Lonesome Dove is Gus and Woodrow F. Call is the other character. It's about two older Texas Rangers. Call is very stoic and he's a little bit scary to people but he has an intense temper and occasionally has to be roped. I, I believe at one point he even has to be lassoed by Gus and some other people to calm down. They don't really talk about this, which I like, is that he's got this seething temper, temper that people just accept part as part of his character because that they're just they're cowboys. They accept each other's characters. Okay, so that's his dark side and his temper. Number five, Quest Destroys Personal Life, a book where the quest is deemed so big the character either chooses to have no personal life or it is destroyed. This goes along with quite a lot of horror I've read, but I'm going to um, choose a book by, and I always get the title wrong, so I'm going to, have to pause again, but it's by Daphne du Maurier. I want to make sure I have the right title because it's similar to another book. Right, okay, it's called The House on the Strand, and I often get it confused with the uh, Hope Hudson book title, The House on the Borderland. The House on the Strand by Daphne du Maurier. It's not one of her 
best known books. It's an excellent novel, though. It's borderline science fiction. Well, not even borderline. Um, this this person does go on a quest. There, it involves time travel. It's a very interesting time travel method that is discovered in this book. Um, a chemical method, we shall say. Uh, I don't want to say more about the book. Read The House on the Strand. If you like Daphne du Maurier and you like her stranger books especially, you know, she's written a lot of many excellent uh, historical novels and she's written uh, some just quite bizarre uh, stories and horror and things like that. I really like The House on the Strand and it fits this this uh, question in the prompt, but I don't want to tell you more about it because I don't want to spoil it. Okay. Number six, questionable decision, a book where the main character makes a questionable decision. Here there's again many, many uh, great options to choose from, so let me go look for one. There's a lot of different ways, as I've been thinking about it, there's a lot of different ways to approach this one. An example, uh, the last video I did, I was speaking about a questionable decision that the main character's girlfriend makes right at the beginning of the book that seems like a generous decision on her part. That book is uh, Strange Angels by Kathy Koja. That's how I think I settled on pronouncing it. Um, it's not the main character, though. Most, uh, many books, especially with young protagonists, start with a questionable decision because we have to have something to get the narrator in trouble. And then probably the better way to start a genre book is the person is gets into trouble because they're, uh, they're choosing the best bad option, the best of a group of bad options. But there is one character who's constantly getting into trouble and constantly having to be bailed out of problems who uh, is basically a moron. And it's the brilliance, brilliance and, the, and the humor of the writer that makes him a lovable character. And that is Bertie Wooster of the Jeeves and Wooster stories. So I don't have to, I can't think of narrowing it down to just one, but he's constantly making incredibly stupid decisions uh, out of the goodness of his heart, you know, usually to help a friend out of some fix, like his friend's trying to get out of a, trying to either get into a engagement or out of an engagement or something like that. There's just some very simple plan that there's some simple uh, difficulty that Bertie uh, decides to help with and immediately makes it a hundred times worse just by his um, his interference and then Jeeves has to come along and, and sort it all out for all of them. So I'll just I'll just say the Jeeves and Wooster stories and novels of P.G. Woodhouse. Number seven, scale change. A book with an object or a place that goes through a scale change. Again, I guess I can call it a book because it, it, all this work does fit into one volume, the, the Conan stories, the Chronicles of Conan uh, by Robert E. Howard. They weren't written to be, uh, to be collected that way specifically, or I could just be more specific and say The Hour of the Dragon, sometimes known as Conan the Conqueror, the Conan novel, and his growth as a character over those stories which were not written chronologically. They were not written to be read in any particular autobiographical order, or biographical order, I don't think. Maybe he would have if he had lived longer and, you know, came to some cohesive end to writing about that character. He might have done that, but Conan starts out as a person who is very much out for himself. He's a thief and a mercenary and a pirate. And in the end, he ends up ruling a kingdom, and in the book The Hour of the Dragon, he is shown as a person who thinks about the greater good, the, the responsibility he has as a king for an entire nation of people, which is not his own people. It's the, it's the, uh, it's, it's the elite um, nation, it's Aquilonia, um, which is 
which is like somebody becoming like a like somebody starting out as a as an ordinary warrior in a Germanic tribe becoming the emperor of Rome or maybe Aquilonia is probably not as powerful as Rome but you know along those lines a wealthy country and he's a he's a foreigner to that country so that was scale change so that's a scale change that goes through the arc of those stories there is a, a scale um, change where he's initially just looking out for himself then later he's a leader, a military leader of different groups, different size groups, uh, you know, different things he's involved in, um, mercenary and uh, seafaring and things like that. So he grows, the, so the scale of his, um, of his adventures changes in that way. Okay, falling, yeah, that was that one. So falling or something to do with gravity, a book that is something or someone is falling or where gravity plays a part okay and purely because i'm still reading it barely really started one sixth of the way through it the decline and fall of the roman empire by edward gibbon is as it says the decline and fall of the roman empire another title which is a big spoiler so don't read it if you don't know what happened to the Roman Empire and don't want to know. Um, but what's fascinating about it is how long it takes, how long this period is. And I didn't know this before I had heard of it. You know, you think it's probably going to be like the the hundred years after the assassination of Caesar or something like that or, or, or the... the, the century or so after all the, you know, the I. Claudius period, all the decadent uh, series of emperors right after Augustus, uh, you know, like Caligula and stuff, all that's part of it, but it goes on and on and on forever, and you really get a sense of how big the empire was, how important it is in history, obviously, and how long it took to fall, and how it's really, you know, in the in the poor Philip K. Dick's imagination, it, you know, it doesn't really fall. It's still here because, you know, it's it's the legacy is everywhere. Anyway, okay, so where am I now? Gravity number nine: Red Herring, False Trail, Use of Codes. A book with a red herring, a false trail, or a quest, or the use of codes. That is a genre of book that I like more in theory than in practice. Uh, you know, there's I, there's the basic uh, the, the basic structure of. Uh, where the term really comes from, where the term is most commonly used, which is who done it, you know, and of course Agatha Christie's the master of that, the mistress of that, and I love her books, her best books, and they're not all good, but most of them are good, and and they of course they don't all have that structure where there's a lot of red herrings. I'm trying to think of a book. I know one that sucked at it. I wonder if I could do that. Is that? It's not actually keeping it positive, but okay. It doesn't say successful false trail quest or use of codes. And one of the dumbest books I ever read was, and I'm not saying this like I'm so smart and I, I, I um, that I could have done any better or anything. But it's Shutter Island um, by I'll look it up by the guy who wrote Mystic River, Dennis Lehane. And as a side note, when I was looking it up, it's so amazing how unpopular fiction is compared to Hollywood. Because if you type in uh, the phrase, the title, Shutter Island, you get a full page of Martin Scorsese, Leo DiCaprio movie stuff before you even get to the book. And there would be no movie without the book. It's not even that, it's not even, uh, that popular of a movie. It's a pretty unpopular movie I think I saw an interview sort of implied Martin Scorsese does, doesn't like it that much anyway it's the stupidest book I've ever read because 
not to brag, but it's very easy to figure out. And uh, it was so easy to figure out, in fact, that I thought, I might have talked about this before, too. I thought, th this is a double trick. There's like, it's making it so obvious what the twist is that there's really a, a second twist. And imagine my surprise when I got to the end of the whole novel and there was no second twist. It was just a very obvious, lame twist that it's meant to be from the beginning. And it's, you know, he, it would have been better, I think. And I don't really think Dennis Lane is a very good plotter. When you think, when you talk out in your mind uh, his stories, I mean, I think Mystic River works because uh, the characterizations are really well wrought. The writing, is, the scenes are well constructed, that kind of thing. But it's pretty ridiculous. Mystic River is just completely implausible that people would even act this way or, or do these things. Uh, if, if you just go back and try to reconstruct the story in your mind of what supposedly had happened. And Sh Shutter Island is like that. It would have been better, I think, if he had tried not to make it a surprise. Just just tell this as a, a real story. Put the reveal at the beginning. We know that the what's going on. It would have... Okay, I'm going to spoil it now, so click ahead click ahead a couple minutes if you care about this stupid movie which you should not care about so the main character is this cop who comes in to investigate a crime on a, a island insane asylum uh, big surprise at the end it turns out he's actually an inmate you never see this coming in a million years unless you've read I don't know two books in your life um, and anyway, he's been, and it's set in the 50s because you could never experiment like this uh, on a person in the 90s or whenever Shutter Island was written. And so, oh no, I'm one of the inmates. Ah! Um, could have been an interesting novel though, actually. If we'd known from the beginning that this poor guy was a victim of some psychiatrist's insane uh, personality surgeon type uh experiment where he's going to do this this experimental uh, very elaborate um, ruse kind of uh, plot movie plot to one of his own inmates to try and break him of his of his um, insanity uh, that would have been actually more interesting but since we don't know any of that till the end you know I thought it was going to be a double back like I thought it was going to be like You know, there's a, there's a crime on the island. They send this cop, Leo DiCaprio in the movie. They send his partner, who's, I, I believe, one of the doctors is pretending to be his partner. Then along the way, uh, we find out he's actually an inmate, and they try to put him away. And then we find out, no, he's not an inmate. He actually was who he thought he was at the beginning. It's just that the doctors, once the cop is there, try and convince him that he's insane and that he belongs there so that... Uh, it's because they're trying to cover up whatever uh, crime uh, happened there and what they're doing. So I thought that's where I thought it was going, but it was like half that. So that would have been better, even though that's still kind of cliche. It's still not as bad as Shutter Island. If he had just done it as a, as a sort of literary thriller where uh, we see this person who we know as as the reader is an inmate and this horrible doctor is experimenting on them, and then we can then we can see whether the inmate who is the subject of this test, who thinks he's uh, free, um, c can escape from this mind game. I don't know. Spent too much time on that. Okay. Which one was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I guess I did that for uh, Red Herring. Okay, number ten, Revenge Punishment, a book with an element of revenge or punishment. Well, I can only think of Count of Monte Cristo, of course. I'm sure that comes to a lot of people's minds. The uh, Captain Blood, which I read by Sabatini. Oh, there's a series called The Demon Princes by <clears throat> The Demon Princes by Jack Vance which is a five book series, very well written. He There's like a 25 year gap in the series. I think he wrote the first two or three, then forgot about it. It's set up to be five books from the beginning. It's a kid who's wronged in this sort of 
you know, medieval kind of uh, space faring, space opera with, with a medieval kind of background thing that, that many old science fiction books were written in, where this guy has to take takes revenge on the five people who um, who wronged his family one book at a time and then he's done very good very good series very fun to re very great action series The Demon Princess by Jack Vance okay that's Revenge and Punishment okay number 11 Rise and Fall a book with a rise in status followed by a catastrophic fall something comes to mind but for some reason I can only think of movies of, of well-known classic novels of the era that I probably don't haven't read enough of like Elmer Gantry and American Tragedy and um, books of that type where there's a person I guess The Great Gatsby you know it's I don't I can't think of any genre books where this happens because usually genre books end up well I could say because it doesn't have to be the hero does it no it doesn't really have to be you could I could say the the foundation trilogy there's a character particularly in the second book called the mule who who was um, who appears and derails the foundation the foundation is a is a is a plan to organize future history set in, into place by Harry Seldon and you know he's a, what's called a psycho historian and he manages to predict the future of the empire over thousands of years and he uh, sort of preloads his own sort of pre-tapes and preloads his own interferences throughout history at, at these pressure points where he thinks uh, things where his model's going off a bit and so he can so he can help guide people on through it um, and there's a Apple series about that which I couldn't get into because I just thought it was so boring but um, the first three foundation books are about that then there's a character comes in the middle called the mule mm -hmm. who is a dictator who threatens to take over the galaxy the the galaxy wide civilization who's not predicted by the model he's like I guess we, we call a black swan and Harry Seldon's novel did not predict him so it's it's quite a, a change in the trajectory of history that you know it's quite a test of the psycho historian it's quite a test of the theme of the novels uh, and uh, very well done and the character becomes very very powerful and then is is defeated another spoiler alert so that's catastrophic fall and it's so funny that that he's his his punishment is his and his humiliation is that they only give him like one planet to rule as a dictator you know, like you can be the dictator of this planet but you'll never uh, be able to affect global history again he's devastated by this this tragedy that he only gets to oppress one planet of people instead of everybody um, number 12, a genius. Which writer to you is a genius or a book with a character that is a genius? Well, P.G. Woodhouse is a genius. I'm convinced of that. Genius to me doesn't mean, um, well, what does it mean? I don't know. P.G. Woodhouse makes it look easy. A lot of people make it look so easy to write humor and I'm just constantly surprised by his books and I'm gonna leave it there many writers are geniuses a character is a genius who would that be probably someone not as interesting to read about as a hero might even become irritating and make a good villain like uh, in the Watchmen series uh, Ozymandias is a good villain but in the Watchmen comic series but I don't know I guess I just don't think about geniuses enough but God bless them I'm gonna leave it there oh I should tag some people I'll probably tag Steve Doniger Steve Donahue uh, see it, to see if he'll do it because you know he has such a wide breadth of uh, of knowledge 
in everything, in, in every genre, in every uh, aspect of, of book reading and history and all that, so I'd be interested to hear what his answers are. I'm looking at these. I don't want to double tag anybody. I have some of my friends on here. Okay, uh, who knows? Consider yourself tagged if you want to do it. And thank you so much again for tagging me, both you guys, and I really appreciate the opportunity to take part in this.